Hey there. Welcome back to another season of Novel Conversations. Before we start the show, I wanted to recommend another great podcast about books. It's the Professional Book Nerds Podcast. If you enjoy listening to Novel Conversations, I think you'll really enjoy this podcast as well. The Professional Book Nerds Podcast offers up book recommendations and interviews your favorite authors every Monday and Thursday. Both Jill Grunenwald and Adam Sokol have spent their careers in the book world and have an inside look on exciting books you're going to love. In addition to their twice-a-week episodes, each month they preview the best new books coming out. They're not just book nerds, they're professional book nerds. Visit professionalbooknerds.com, subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts, or check them out on our own network, evergreenpodcasts.com. All right, up next, Novel Conversations. I'm Frank Lavallo, and this is Novel Conversations, a podcast about the world's greatest stories. For each episode of Novel Conversations, I talk to two readers about one book, and together we summarize the story for you. We introduce you to the characters, we tell you what happens to them, and we read from the book along the way. So if you love hearing a good story, you're in the right place. This week's conversation is about the novel Jude the Obscure by Thomas Hardy. And I'm joined in our conversation today by our Novel Conversations readers, Elizabeth Flood and Phil Setnick. Elizabeth, Phil, hi. Hello. Hello. Phil, Elizabeth, before we get into our discussion, let me set up our story. Jude the Obscure is a novel by Thomas Hardy, and it was published in 1895. It's the story of Jude Farley and the two women in his life, Sue Bridehead and Arabella Dunn. Raised as an orphan by an elderly aunt, Jude works as a stonemason. But inspired by his beloved teacher Richard Philipson, he spends the rest of his time reading and studying in the hopes of pursuing his dream of becoming a professor in the great university town of Christminster. But his aspirations are hindered by the elitism practiced by the ancient universities and by his discovery of women, a fresher and wilder pleasure than his books. His frustrated ambition for an academic ecclesiastical life becomes lost in his sexual appetite for Arabella and his spiritual need for Sue. Moving away from the achievement he once desired, Jude is drawn towards a despairing conflict with society and its conventions, a conflict which leads to ruin and disaster. So, let's talk more about these characters. What I want to do now is start talking a little bit about Jude and how he comes to end up in the situations we have him in at the end of the novel. Phil, let's start with you. Jude is, first of all, a very naive man. He's a very passionate scholar and dreams of being something way beyond his meager and humble existence. And Phil, isn't that really where his naivete comes from? He's not an unintelligent person, but he's really a socially backward person. He's lived in a small hamlet, so he doesn't really have the social graces. Indeed, but he has big dreams. He also has a lot of dedication initially to those dreams. He reads every opportunity he gets. He manages to find ways to get books, including writing to his old professor, Philipson. And he eats up every bit of information he can. But unfortunately, he's also a very innocent person. He reads always. He even reads when he's on the stonemason wagon. He just lets the horse travel the road to the point where the police have to stop him from reading while he's driving, in case he runs someone over. Yes, that's quite true. He reads at night voraciously until the early morning hours, subsisting on a small amount of sleep so that he can devote himself to his beloved books. And he is also able to take in other languages, Greek and Latin. Right, Phil. He's reading some of the great works in their original language. And all of this with a goal in mind, when Philipson left the village of Mary Green where they lived. Elizabeth, let's just remind our listeners, Richard Philipson was a schoolmaster, and the schoolmaster leaves the little town to go to Christminster to become a professor himself. And of course, that's the life that Jude wants to emulate. Yes, he hopes to become a doctor of divinity someday, especially since Philipson told him on his way out of town that to be anybody, a man had to go to university. Now, Phil, you said that his naivete is what leads him into his trouble. He's a book-learned man, but that does not help him when he meets the first woman in his life, Arabella Dunn. No, it does not. In Jude's case, the spirit to learn was willing, but the flesh was weak. Arabella, daughter of a pig farmer, hurls a piece of pig at him. To catch his attention. To catch his attention, yeah. And indeed she does, and lures him into, essentially, a trap, whereby she gets him to marry her, thinking that she's pregnant. Well, Phil, does it start out attempting to lure him into a trap, or does it just start a little bit more innocently? I don't think it starts innocently at all. She knows that she has to find a husband, 
There are apparently slim pickings in town. She sees him and she goes for him. However, she does not have the street smarts at that point in the story because she has to refer to her friends and ask their opinion. And they are the ones that say, this is how you trap him. And what are the street smarts that her friends impart to her? That all you have to do is say that you're pregnant. Or actually, it's not say that you're pregnant, but become pregnant. Arabella carries it to a further point. She says she's pregnant when indeed she is not. And that really belies her cunning as well. Hardy gives us a line, She was a complete and substantial female animal. No more, no less. Right, Phil. I think Hardy foreshadows for us where this relationship is going to go. So Arabella leads Jude into a clearly at the time illicit love affair, tells him she's pregnant, and what does Jude decide to do? Well, of course he marries her because that's what an honest and honorable man would do. And those clearly were the conventions of the time. Is this a successful marriage? Not at all. It starts off with him discovering she is wearing a hairpiece on the wedding night. Mm -mm. And he is struck by the fact that part of her is bony, and it's very symbolic. As time progresses and he finds out that she indeed is not pregnant, he knows he has been had. But he's stuck. He will honor the vow to both of their miseries. And this happens within a month of their marriage. And I was struck by the fact that she so heartlessly cast aside his books, threw them on the ground... And this had been and really was the love of his life. Right. She's killing a pig, and then she handles his books, throws them out onto the street covered in pig grease and pig blood. We know this marriage is not going to last. Arabella comes up with a solution to their dilemma. She decides to leave. She goes with her father to Australia. And Jude is now left married, but wifeless. He decides to rededicate himself to his books, but somewhat on a different track now. Well, he heads off to Christminster and tries to pick up where he left off. The first thing he does is, of course, go and visit his old Professor Philipson, who had said upon departure from Marygreen, look me up whenever you get to Christminster. And upon Jude's arrival, he is surprised to learn that, number one, Philipson has not achieved his own goal, but he has settled for being a teacher. And number two, he does not remember Jude at all. So it didn't bode well for his success at Christminster. In fact, it's very disheartening for Jude. Here's the guy he chose to emulate, and he finds him in circumstances that haven't changed at all since the little town. Maybe the school's a bit larger, but basically Mr. Philipson is in the same place doing the same thing. Precisely. But Phil, Jude comes to meet another person at Christminster. He eventually finally meets his cousin, Sue Bridehead. Yes. And he finds her intelligent where Arabella is not. She's a rebel, an atheist, or an agnostic, where he is very religiously oriented. She wants very much to be taken as an intellect rather than dealing with the gender roles that society would give her. That of a woman who be religious, will be married, will bear children. You know, when I first met Sue Bridehead, I got that Hardy wanted to tell us she was an atheist. But I didn't get the feeling from the beginning that she was going to be the feminist that she then comes across as being. What was evident to me early was her lack of belief in religion. There's a great scene where she's in a park and she decides to buy some little statues to decorate her room with. And they are classical art statues and not religious icons. Right, right. Do you remember who the statues were? Venus and Apollo. Something that did not please her religious landlady. She was staying at a facility that made religious icons and sold things for the church and was not supposed to be adorning her room with anything secular. But into this room, she brings the plaster statues of Venus and Apollo, the pagan gods. And she makes the mistake of saying that they are St. Mary Magdalene and St. Peter. And eventually even Sue realizes that these statues are out of place. And Thomas Hardy has a line here. Occasionally she looked up at the statues, which appeared strange and out of place. There happening to be a cavalry print hanging between them. So, as I said, for me, right away it was evident that Sue Bridehead was an atheist and was not going to share the religious beliefs of Jude. Clearly, she would not call herself a feminist, but she was not happy, and she was not satisfied with the conventions for women at her time. No, she had major issues with marriage. She thought it was basically a legal way to tie a woman up for life, and also to trap a man into something that he could never find himself extricated from. And Phil, was this anti-marriage feeling tied up with her anti-religious feelings as well? I believe so, yes. Also, Aunt Drusilla who at one point in each of their lives raised them both and cautioned them that Follies should never marry because it never works out for them. That's right. Both Sue's parents and Jude's parents had terrible marriages, and Jude's parents ultimately died. His mother committed suicide. Sue's parents divorced, and she found her father going off to London and leaving her with Aunt Drusilla for a spell. 
I think that, in and of itself, forecasted doom for their attitudes towards marriage. Also, I think the fact that when Jude left home, he was told to stay away from Sue, and nothing is more alluring than that which we are not supposed to go near. Right. And not only did his aunt tell him not to marry, she specifically told him to avoid his cousin Sue Bryden. And he was already enthralled with her because he'd seen her photograph on the mantle for years. And of course, the first thing he was going to do when he got to Christminster was to look up Sue. And he did. All right, so Jude and Sue have finally met each other. But before we talk about what happens in this relationship, let's take a moment to talk about our sponsor for this season of Novel Conversations, Literati, the leading kids' book club in America. Right now, with libraries and schools and bookstores shut down, how do you keep your kids learning and growing? Books from Literati, the number one book club for kids, is the best place to start. Literati is a subscription book club that makes it easy to find unique and interesting books for your kids by delivering great stories straight to your doorstep. Literati knows that home deliveries will be critical in meeting your need for uplifting educational materials in the coming weeks. And reading books together will help create a time of adventure and bonding for your entire family. And each Literati box contains five beautiful books based on a theme and contains exclusive original art and a personalized note for your child. As a fan of books and as a fan of reading, I've got to support any organization or any company that combines those two passions. And Literati does just that. They pick books, they send them to your children, your children get to read these specially selected books, and then you only keep the ones that you like. You only keep the books that your children loved. Everything else you send back for free. And Literati will match the Amazon list price for any book you select. So right now, as a gift to fans of Novel Conversations, we're giving our listeners a special limited time offer. If you go to literati.com slash novel, you'll get 25% off your first two orders. Let me say that again. That's literati.com slash novel. Literati, L-I-T-E-R-A-T-I, literati.com slash novel. 25% off your first two orders. All right, let's get back to our discussion about the novel Jude the Obscure by Thomas Hardy. Before we took our break, Jude and Sue had just met. Let's talk about how Thomas Hardy foreshadows what's going to happen in this relationship, and ultimately the ending of the novel. Let me read a couple of lines and then we'll talk about them. He affected to think of her quite in a family way, since there were crushing reasons why he should not and could not think of her in any other. The first reason was he was married, and it could be wrong. The second was that they were cousins. It was not well for cousins to fall in love, even when circumstances seemed to favor the passion. The third, even were he free, in a family like his own where marriage usually meant a tragic sadness, marriage with a blood relation would duplicate the adverse conditions and a tragic sadness might be intensified into a tragic horror. Eventually, this relationship does become a tragic horror, doesn't it, Elizabeth? Yes, it certainly does. First, she loses her job. But wait, wait, let's go back. We talked about her pagan statues that she had brought into her little convent room, and that does in fact cause her to lose her job. Yes, and Jude arranges for her to have employment with Philipson as a co-teacher. This, of course, leads down the path to Philipson falling in love with her and to her eventually agreeing to marry Philipson after a period of time when she's going to attend a teaching college. Philipson is actually the one that sends her to the teaching college. He wants her to get a certificate and perhaps maybe even become a little bit more respectable by getting a license. By getting a license, she could, without any problems with society, take on the role as co-teacher in any given school where they might both be together. But things don't go well for Sue at the teaching college, do they? She can't stay away from Jude. And Jude certainly can't stay away from her. They run off and get themselves out in the country, where they can't get back on time. She stays with him overnight and is caught in the morning by the head of the school and basically sequestered, something she can't stand. So she escapes, runs off to do it again. And this causes quite a scandal. And results in her having to move her marriage plans to Philipson up quite considerably. Because even Philipson has now been touched by this scandal. It's absolutely necessary that he marry her now so that the scandal doesn't reach epic proportions. And so he does. But she's not happy. The marriage is never consummated because Sue has her own conflicts within, and she doesn't really love Philipson. And he loses his job when he gives her a divorce so that she can go to Jude. And that's the continuing scandal. He has let his wife leave him to go to the arms of another man, and the town is shocked. Stunned. And at the same time... Arabella surfaces again. Yep, yep. Eventually Arabella does come back, but first Sue and Jude get together to some extent. They get together the same way she got together with Philipson, 
It's essentially asexually. They're a platonic couple, not at his insistence, but at hers. But they are living together, and they are, for all appearances, a married couple. And then our friend Arabella knocks on the door, and all of a sudden, it occurs to Sue that it's put-up or shut-up time. So she decides that she will consummate her relationship with Jude to keep him from going back to Arabella. And on the heels of their newly consummated relationship, Arabella advises Jude that he has a son on the way from Australia. That's right, Elizabeth. There's another knock on the door. It's the son of Arabella and Jude, which she did not tell him about until this inopportune moment. And so, Father Time, young Jude, though he has never called anything but Father Time... Now, why is he called Father Time? Because he is the appearance of age and the melancholy that comes with age. He not only appears to be old, he acts like an old man, he speaks like an old man. Extremely depressed child. Yes, truly a depressed child with no view of life that could possibly be anything but depressed. But guys, the arrival of Father Time doesn't destroy the relationship between Sue and Jude. Much to my surprise, that's correct. Sue is very accepting of the child, and in fact, over a period of time, they do have children of their own. But we never get names or genders. You know, for me, it seemed quite abrupt. At one moment, they're living together platonically. Jude's son shows up, and then practically the next chapter, it's five years later, and there's other children, and she's actually pregnant with a third child. Makes you wonder what Hardy edited out. The children show up in the story as non-creatures, almost. As we approach the pivotal moment of the book, they are having difficulty because their relationship has not been legalized by the church. And it's now come out throughout the entire neighborhood, again, that this is not a married couple. Jude wants to marry her. They do, in fact, go to the clerk's office. They do, in fact, go to a church. But each time, Sue backs out. And even when they go to London, ostensibly to marry, they don't. Something which is also very disturbing to little Father Time, because now he is being beat up at school and picked upon because his parents aren't married. Right, and this is what I want to get to. You mentioned that now we've reached a pivotal moment in the novel. Are you ready to tell us about this pivotal moment? Sadly, yes. Little Father Time is already a depressed child, and Jude and Sue have returned to Christminster in hopes of finding a place where they can live together without people bothering them. When they finally get someone to let them stay, they won't take Jude. He has to stay somewhere else. And this is tough on his son. It's very difficult on his son, and very difficult on Sue as well. So Sue embarks on a conversation with him, with Little Father Time, as to why Dad can't stay with them. And she elects to treat him like an adult in this conversation. And that's because throughout this entire novel, that's the visage we see. He's adult-like. He looks older, he talks older, he acts older. She decides to treat him like that, but that's not really a good idea. And her conversation is one that makes him even more depressed. Here's a quote from the book to elucidate. Father went away to give us children room, didn't he? Partly. It would be better to be out of the world than in it, wouldn't it? It would almost dare. Tis because of us children, too, isn't it, that you can't get a good lodging? Well, people do object to children sometimes. And then Hardy goes on to tell us little Father Time virtually ends their conversation with, I think that whenever children be born that are not wanted, they should be killed directly before their souls come to them and not allowed to grow big and walk about. This is a very depressed child, and unfortunately Sue allows him to go off to bed with this weighing on his mind. The next morning, after she goes out to breakfast with Jude, Jude and she find little Father Time hanging with his siblings in the spare room, he having killed them all and left a note that said, Because we are too many. On the morning of August 1st, 1966, shots ring out from the observation deck of the clock tower on the University of Texas campus. It marks the infamous beginning of the modern era of mass shootings in America. You're listening to Stop the Killing podcast. Join us as we take you behind the crime scene tape to explain global mass shootings and mass attacks. I'm Sarah Ferris, but more importantly, this is Catherine Schweitz, the former head of the FBI's active shooter program. I spent five years as the FBI's top executive looking for answers to the mass shooting crisis. I've been at the shooting scenes. I've traced heroic acts of bravery. And I've sat silently and listened to the heart-wrenching stories from survivors. Amongst this horror, there is hope. We all hold the key to stop the killing. You just need to know how to unlock the door. Download Stop the Killing and be part of the solution. Search Stop the Killing on Apple, Spotify, and all the usual suspects. You know, this was a really hard scene for me to read. It almost made me want to turn away from the novel. It was horrifying. 
There were few times, despite the heaviness of this book, that I cried. But I did cry when these three children had been sacrificed to the egos or conflicting expectations of Jude and Sue and the society. The things that struck me was how many people were guilty here, beyond Jude and Sue. It went to everybody who turned them away, to everybody who passed judgment on them for not being married, and went to the law that says you have to be married, that Sue so objected to. The letter killeth a phrase that's used in the book. And that letter is the letter of the law. And also the whole society that said he was to be in his place. And he could perhaps be a stonemason, but he should never aspire to the heights of intellect and profession that he so desperately wanted. So, Phil, Elizabeth, as we can imagine, this kind of tragedy has profound effects on both Sue and on Jude. To my mind, there's almost a complete role reversal that begins here and then is completed by the end of the novel. I'd agree entirely. Sue has always been the skeptic, and Jude has always been the one theologically oriented. And yet, at this point, he gives up any hope, any faith, any structure, theologically speaking. And Sue, on the other hand, apparently goes to the church for her redemption. Elizabeth, I want to ask you about your use of the word apparently, but first let me get Phil's opinion on how these two characters really change. Jude is craving logic. He's trying to understand. Right. He begins to rail against his God. Explain this to me, he says. Sue, on the other hand, is attempting to figure out what she did wrong to deserve all this. Right. She considers it divine retribution. Absolutely. She believes that it's Jude's son come to kill her children. Yes. And she does tell him that. As a result, she feels she must do what she should have done in the first place, which is to return to her rightful husband, Mr. Philipson. And she manages to convince Jude to do the right thing and return to his rightful wife, Arabella. But now, Elizabeth, you said apparently makes this conversion, but you're not completely sold on it, are you? No, I'm not. I don't know if one can make that kind of switch, honestly, simply because there's been a tragedy in your life. You don't believe a tragedy like that would cause you to seek your God? It may cause one to seek one's God. However, I'm not sure that that necessarily is a true heart-changing experience. I believe, Phil, you used the term hedging her bets. Yes. You know the old saying, there are no atheists in foxholes. I do. I think that she needed to feel responsible. She even admits that she had this conversation with Little Father Time, and Jude asks her, why did you do that? And she knows that this is what drove the child. So a lot of this is guilt on her part. All right, but what about Jude's change from a believer to a secularist? Was that an apparent change, or do you believe that change? I do believe that change, because it was gradual. It was not caused by this tragedy. There was a sense of diminution of his devotion. Phil, do you believe this change, more so than you believe Sue's change? Yes, I do. Predominantly because his change was born of the intellect that Sue showed. She had convinced him that essentially her stance on things was correct. And that's part of his being perplexed at the end, how she could convince him and then could abandon those thoughts. And I would suggest that perhaps the tragedy has pushed her over the edge, that she is no longer a rational being. There may be some loss of sanity. And he views her going back to Philipson as something really immoral and says to her, do not do an immoral thing for moral reasons. But Elizabeth, you're not suggesting that her going back to religion is a symptom of her possible madness, or or are you? Yes, I am. Because she retreats not only from Jude, but from society and places herself physically in the church on the altar, praying to God whom she's never believed in. She dresses herself in sackcloth as the ultimate way of proving that she is going to follow God's law, surrenders herself physically to her husband. To Philipson. Yes. This is something she had never done before. After he had insisted that she swear on the Bible. And that if he let her into his bedroom, she would never leave again. Exactly. Yes. All right. In this last segment, what I want to know from you is, why read this book? It's very depressing. We've talked about it being complex. We've talked about it being tragic. But what recommends the book to us? Why pick this book up, Phil? Well, because not every story has a happy ending. If we were to believe that it did, well, we'd never read any Shakespeare's tragedies. But most novels have happy endings, don't they? We can't all be Anthony Trollope. Everything can't be happy, and real life is not happy. And I think that's what Thomas Hardy was seeking to teach us here. He gives us a secondary theme that this is the tragedy of unfulfilled aims, and that's what makes Jude obscure. He's a man who lives unknown and dies unaccomplished. That happens a lot. That alone makes it worth reading. Elizabeth, all great books don't have to be happy, do they? No, they do not. In fact, I find those that are consistently happy are not fulfilling. What was fulfilling to you about this novel? I like 
liked the sense of character. I began liking Jude because he was involved in the mind, and I liked Sue because she was intelligent. I didn't like Arabella because she was crafty and conniving. However, she was also fun. She was. Philipson, I trust his honesty. I trust his honorableness. I trust his thirst for knowledge. But he's really boring, and I would never have married him. Phil, you also have some thoughts about Arabella? I thought she was bawdy. I thought she was full of life. I thought she was resourceful. I wouldn't want my son to marry her. (laughs) I think she wreaked havoc on every heart she touched. But she was a survivor in many respects. She was the sloppier side of Sue. And I think she was a whole lot more honest than Sue. She knew what she was, and she didn't presume to be different. She was probably the most honest character throughout the entire novel. She was honest despite her deceit at the beginning, but she also understood people. She knew the night that she went to see Jude and Sue that they hadn't consummated their relationship. And later on, she knew that it was because of her visit that they did. Nobody told her she knew. And at the end, she says, the last quote in the book, She may swear that on her knees, she being Sue, to the holy cross upon her necklace that she is still a horse, but it won't be true. She's never found peace since she left his arms and never will again until she is as he is now. That, she says, standing over Jude's grave. She knew how much they loved each other, and I think she felt some compassion for that. I think the thing that I will remember most is when Jude has been left alone as Arabella went off at the Remembrance Day celebration, and he is literally dying for water, and neither Arabella nor Sue can come to his aid. And with the Remembrance Day hurrahs echoing in his ears as he had hoped they would when he would graduate, he whispered slowly through his parched lips, quote, Let the day perish wherein I was born, and the night in which it was said there is a man-child conceived. Hurrah! Let that day be darkness. Let not God regard it from above, neither let the light shine upon it. Lo, let that night be solitary. Let no joyful voice come therein. Hurrah! Why died I not from the womb? Why did I not give up the ghost when I came out of the belly? For now, should I have lain still and been quiet, I should have slept. Then had I been in rest. Hurrah! Elizabeth, that is a beautiful passage, and I think we should make sure we say that again. Certainly, the topic of this book is tragic. Certainly, the events are not happy. But this is a well-written, a very well-written book. The writing alone should recommend this book to you. Yes, and the symbolism. There are several references in it to Samson and Delilah, which I find very prophetic. And I understand there's several quotes from Job in there as well. Indeed. And there's constant references to both pagan deities and pagan characters, as well as religious deities and religious characters. Yes, and Arabella was his Delilah. If you read this book a couple of times, you pick up on these little details and you start to think about it. And that is what makes it so rich. I have a couple of lines here that I would like to read. This occurs after Jude has been in Christminster a little while and he realizes his dreams have been dashed. He's not going to get into this university. When he first came to the town, the colleges were soaring spires and the bells were ringing. He looked forward to being on the inside of these walls. Now that he's realized his dreams will not come true, this is how he sees the town. And I quote, Passing out into the streets on this area, and he found that the colleges had treacherously changed their sympathetic countenances. Some were pompous. Some had put on the look of family vaults above ground. Something barbaric loomed in the masonry of all. The spirits of the great men had disappeared. Well... I want you to remember as you're reading this book that Jude is the patron saint of lost causes. He is. Indeed. And for anybody reading the book, you will see the different references in it and wonder, is Hardy telling you an argument for or an argument against? And you really don't know. And that's what makes it obscure. And our listeners will not know unless they read the book. And with that, I think we'll end our conversation here. Elizabeth, Phil, I want to thank you both very much for joining me in a novel conversation about Thomas Hardy's Jude the Obscure. Oh, thank you so much, Frank. I'm so glad to be back. Thanks for giving us the chance to talk about the book. Absolutely. I appreciate both of you being here. You've been listening to Novel Conversations. Novel Conversations is a production of Evergreen Podcasts, formerly the Front Porch People. If you'd like to hear more Novel Conversations, you can go to our new network at evergreenpodcast.com or listen on iTunes, Spotify, or your favorite podcast app. And if you like the podcast, don't forget to leave us a review. It really helps. Novel Conversations was produced by Julie Fink and engineered by Sean Rule Hoffman. 
A special thanks to our executive producer, Joni Andrews, and our researchers, Jean Badger and Victoria Nash. And I'm your host, Frank Lavallo. Until next time, I hope you find yourself in a novel conversation. On the morning of August 1st, 1966, shots ring out from the observation deck of the clock tower on the University of Texas campus. It marks the infamous beginning of the modern era of mass shootings in America. You're listening to Stop the Killing podcast. Join us as we take you behind the crime scene tape to explain global mass shootings and mass attacks. I'm Sarah Ferris, but more importantly, this is Catherine Schweitz, the former head of the FBI's active shooter program. I spent five years as the FBI's top executive looking for answers to the mass shooting crisis. I've been at the shooting scenes. I've traced heroic acts of bravery. And I've sat silently and listened to the heart-wrenching stories from survivors. Amongst this horror, there is hope. We all hold the key to stop the killing. You just need to know how to unlock the door. Download Stop the Killing and be part of the solution. Search Stop the Killing on Apple, Spotify, and all the usual suspects. This podcast was produced with the support of the Ohio Motion Picture Tax Credit and in partnership with the Ohio Development Services Agency.